Welcome to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, where we aim to give swimming the coverage and publicity it deserves. Every week, we celebrate the sport we love with amazing special guests and topics from around the swimming pool. And now, here are your hosts, Scott and Dan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I'm your host, Scott, and with me, as always, is my good friend, Dan. Dan, how are you doing? You had a good week. We're back and rolling now with the podcast. I know. It's great to be back. It really has been great to be back. We had a fantastic guest in Alicia last week, and we've got another fantastic guest this week as well. Really looking forward to this one. Yeah, something a little bit different. And I know we've Mm. spent a lot of time previously leading up to the Olympics about elite swimming, elite British swimming. But we have always said that we want to change things up and support other areas of British swimming because it isn't just the elite guys that need shouting and screaming about. So on this week's podcast, we actually have a very interesting guest in Nathan Young. So Nathan is a member of GB Deaf Swimming. And unlike the swimmers who are going to be going off to the Paralympics in the next few weeks and race and get all of the media coverage and funding that they deserved, Nathan faces the prospect of having his own swimming journey unfunded, not being funded by British Swimming and what he's trying to do is raise recognition for the Deaf Olympics to actually be supported in this country. Because even though right now it isn't an Olympic funded disability, um, the Deaf Olympics, which Nathan has attended, are recognized by the IOC, meaning that Nathan not only has to fund his own swimming training and racing costs to get to these Deaf Olympics, but he also has to race against fully funded athletes from other nations. So he, he's trying to create a campaign um, and basically raise some more awareness, get Death Olympics to the profile level that the Paralympics is, because it should be. It should be. It's all about equality, isn't it? has to be. Mm. I mean, uh, yeah, we obviously we don't know enough about it. That's the reason why we want to get Nathan on. And Nathan is going to be effectively leading this podcast to explain to everyone why it should be on the same level as the Paralympics. Yeah. Now, before we get into the murky waters of funding, let's let's hear from Nathan a little bit more about his journey through swimming, because Nathan, I know you're not going to face the same challenges that other people face in the swimming pool. They're going to be you're going to have a very different journey. So why don't we start off with how did you first get into swimming? Um, That's probably around maybe like 10 or 11, you know, the normal swimming lessons. My mum thought, well, I'm there. So she wanted me to have something that I can look towards to build some confidence in different areas. Mm -hmm. So swimming was just a natural, natural route for me to go down. And then obviously with the with the problems that I had at school with not being able to hear things, I actually ended up taking time out of the water and get myself back together and then joined a, a club when I was 14, like a, a normal swimming club. And obviously went to all the swimming and um, went went to them. And then actually joined GB Death Swimming Club when I was about 15. And then a year later I was in Texas um, at the World Death Swimming Championships and I was the, the, the youngest, um, the youngest uh, in the final um, mm. when I was there, and then it's really gone from there. Went to the Olympics in Turkey, Europeans in Poland, and then recently just went to the Worlds in Brazil. Oh, that's been that quite a, nice. a whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind doing that all the time. It'd be very nice. <laughs> I mean- <laughs> I mean, I've seen the photos as well from these Deaf Olympics. They're, yeah. they're not small occasions. They're big things, aren't they? It's not yeah, like they- a small swimming meet at all. Yeah, I'm surprised that no one actually hears of it because it's it is a big thing, like you said. But not not no, everyone that I've spoken to just don't know anything about it. <laughs> well, that's why you're here today. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, so what challenges do you face in a swimming pool that are different to your teammates who who aren't deaf? Well, obviously in the pool, I can't actually hear, so the communication can you know obviously be a bit of a long process. I am able to lift weights, you know, to a good standard, which obviously I think people might not. Dis- might disagree with because obviously the communication takes forever <laughs> um but but yeah so now um i use hand signals um with my coaches you know um just to not it's not so, so so much a style language it's more like the key the key um technical swimming hand signals that you might get in with them, everything but i think the most challenges actually come when it's racing when i'm racing to be honest um so obviously deaf athletes use a um well, the, the, now they use a strobe like just one single strobe but in the past there's no such thing as that because of technology sort of advanced from that 
Um, but, not, but it's one single throw, and that's only to let you know when to go. So before I race, I don't know when to get on the block. Oh, I don't wow. know when to take your marks. So I have to sort of like look to my left and look to my right, see when to get on the block. But then I always run around the block. Uh, no matter where I am, I've got to try and look at the the referee and sort of l- see where see where his lip, lip read, mm. when he starts lip reading and know yeah. he's staying taking marks. But all that should never happen because I should be focused on the race and looking yeah. at, down at the block. And so there's loads, loads of little, uh, little challenges that I might have. So when at the start of the race, obviously for, for the able body swimmers, they have the buzzer. So how would you yeah. know when to dive in for a race? It's the, it's the flash. We've got it that is. one single stroke. But yes, yeah. that's that's all well and good, but it's more the how do I get the flash? Yeah, and yeah. sometimes the light's not even there when I turn up for the block, so I have to. There's been so many instances where it's um, not being there, so I've had to go in the next competition. I have to go up like four, four, five heats before the racing to make sure it's there. But leading up to that, I'm like, I don't know if it's still there. I don't know if it's still there. And also, mm. sometimes it's not, it's never worked as well. So I'm on the block and everyone's dived in in front of me and it's not worked. Oh, blimey. So are you actually racing in usual able body open meets in this country? Yeah, um, we have like one deaf competition um, that we attend once a year. Um, but that's obviously within the club, um, GB Deaf Swimming. But yeah, I swim sort of mainstream. I was invited to one power meet, but I'm, I'm not being invited back. So I was gone there. <laughs> And that's the same with the training. You train with able body swimmers as well as the deaf swimmers too? Yes, because I've um yeah, so I swim with Real Metro and yeah, I've I've been to Liverpool and I've been I've been around, so yeah, it's been always been mainstream clubs. So say you're you're racing at a competition which is able body open meet, and you you said your heat's coming up in four or five times. Who resp- whose responsibility is it? to put that strobe on the block for you ready to go. Do you have to do it or does your coach do it? Do the officials make sure it's there for you? Uh, well, I'm supposed to go up or make coach whoever, but I, I quite like taking responsibility to go and do it, even though I shouldn't have to do it in the first place. But I do mm-hmm. it. I go up and put the um, distro. Well, I tell them that I'm in these, these heats, but there's been so many instances where I've done that, but it's not been there. And when I get to the block, I'm like, Wait, wait, I have to start the race. I put my hand up and I'm like, no, no, you can't go yet. I still not here. Oh, um, blimey. Yeah, so I, I, I've always got that nervous anxiety about whether it's going to be there. I went to a race a competition recently and there was two strays, one in lane five, one in lane four. And um, the one in lane four wasn't working because I was racing in lane five. But my next race was in lane four. But I, I remember previously that wasn't working. So I had to like oh, no. stop it because I had to make sure that one was working before I went on the block. Oh, blimey. It doesn't sound overly helpful for you if you're trying to prepare for a race. You've got all of these other things going on in your head that just get yeah. in the way of you having a good performance. Um, yeah. I mean, it, in my opinion, actually, Dan, for able bodies, a light or something like that on the blocks wouldn't be that. I don't know, not on, un- it would be beneficial for able body swimmers as well, because we saw at Europeans when Brody Williams, the speaker in his block didn't go off. So, I mean, yeah. it's a, it's a perfectly capable adaptation to add this strobe to every block. If, if someone can find a more cost-effective way of adding it into the existing system, I actually mm. think it would benefit able body swimmers, not just deaf swimmers like yourself, Nathan. I, 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 I'm kind of interested, actually. So, you know, you struggle with the getting up onto the blocks because, you know, you, you can't hear the, the whistles to get onto the blocks. What would you what would you suggest would be the best thing to get you through that sort of phase rather than looking around and checking what everyone else is doing? Well, um, at the international competition that I go to, they've got a, a traffic light system. OK. Um, so obviously the most two, the last two competitions I've been to um, have both had like this on normal traffic lights. So it's red, amber, green, so red, get on the block. And we mm. get to take Mars and then Green Go. I mean, that, that's as simple as it can get, really. Mm. Um, yeah. it doesn't, I think the, the whole situation around it is will it connect with the system that starts to everyone off? It's got to connect to it. Yeah. So I don't think they want to spend the money to try and um, get maybe find a way of doing it. And they're quite happy with this one screw. But with all, the, with all the problems that it causes me, I think something needs to, needs to be improved, really. Do you know what the, the cost difference is between the traffic light and the strobe? 
I, I don't know the the, the, the traffic light, but I know the strobe on itself is just a five hundred pound. I think that's what I was told. Okay. I mean, that's right. not a small investment, is it? It's, I don't know, you would have thought it could come down slightly. I don't know if there's a way to figure, figure that one out. I, don't know. I, I was reading something, actually. I think it was on, um, I think on Swim Swam. And they, some swimmer has invented a new sort of strobe and traffic light and putting it at the end of blocks. I think she was a backstroker. Um, so I think it's, it's on the, it's on the um, improvement, if you like. Um, so yeah. it's, it, it's just a case of gaining exposure and building up the profile of deaf swimmers and what it's like to be a deaf swimmer in the deaf Olympics, of course. So if we um, touch upon a little bit more about the, the funding that you have. So we said in the introduction, you basically get nothing from British women to support your, your career and um, your journey through swimming. So I'm going to ask you to speak about a few numbers and maybe shock some people into understanding just how financially insecure your career is. So how much does it cost you off your own back to train right now? It's, it's gone um, because of COVID. The fees have gone up again. So mm. it's, um, it's a, is it 110 pound now? A month. Yeah, 110 pound. I think so, yeah, 110 pound a month, yeah. And then what sort of costs are you facing when you go to these international competitions? So when you went to Texas, I, I presume there's quite a hefty, yeah. a hefty uh, plane bill was, for that one. With flights and stuff, yeah. Yeah, that was that was three grand. But that's not including um that's not including care, food and like, you know, the supplements that you sort of take along with you. Yeah. So, so um, all, yeah. All in all, if you're going to the Deaf Olympics, what sort of figure does that set you back each time probably like four, four, three and a half something like that oh, every time that's a lot the, of money the, trunk, the, the trunks are what 375 you don't yeah. you know you so know, you can't even get like a a sponsor through speedo or anything like that a tyr um or ts uh, sponsored us for um step olympics yeah but since then I've, I've, I've literally tried to get loads of different sponsors and they've uh They've said, oh, no, we've used up all our money for the year on other athletes. So, obviously. So, what's a, not... what sort of level are you competing at as well? So, are you right at the top end? Are your your finalists at these Deaf Olympics yeah. and Def international competitions? Yeah, I came fifth twice at um, Worlds last year, of 2019. And I was um, I was only half a second off third, so I was quite gutted about that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at the top, um, but I'm hoping to try to do it this this uh in this next death Olympics coming in may where have you got to go to for that one uh brazil again oh, these, brazil. They're, not, they're not close to these places it's not like <laughs> like europe where it's like a three hour two hour flight but no brazil is like a 10 hour flight yeah wow it's, it's a long flight yeah, a long yeah. Flight. Oh God. Well, God. you've been um, you've been doing a campaign as well on twitter that we've been seeing um how is that campaign going for you it's been really good. I mean, I'm on, I think it's 110 days of now questioning or raising awareness of like why the, well, it's the government really, isn't it? The government that set, that set who the money's going to. So mm. it's on 110 days of trying to um, campaign against this and we've had no real response, to be honest. Um, we've, we've got like responses, but when you actually look at the replies of emails, it's very much the same from each person just twisted around saying that oh, really? like, we can't do this because you're not under the uh, you're not under the Paralympics and it's like well we we've been we, um the Paralympics um the Jeep Def Olympics has been going since 1924 making it the second longest running multi four long mm. but obviously they're seeing Paralympics as more exposure for them so they're not going to put it into the Def Olympics. And the Def Olympics other like I said other countries are fully funded for this aren't they? <laughs> Yeah, some countries like Russia, obviously funded. Um, Ireland, the Ireland has been told they're funded, um, oh, wow. and they took two. They only took two swimmers um, to the Olympics. Yeah, to they're funded. I did not know that. Wow, <laughs> that that surprises me even more. Have you got an Irish grandmother you can find out of nowhere? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a look. I have a look at the family tree. <laughs> <laughs> So, how, how many other swimmers in this country are in the same boat as you? Well, I mean, because well, that's the problem that we faced is that since Death Olympics, we've lost all our, our, our swimmers, really, because obviously I was the only swimmer to actually go to the world in 2019 in Brazil. I, I had to pay for my coach in that same, so, as well. So, 
I actually paid five grand instead of my normal two and a half. I had to pay five grand for him to go. So God. yeah, that was that was another big um big fundraising thing that I had to do. Um so I was the only one, but partly um there's now we've got a European short course coming up in November, which is in Poland, thankfully, so it's closer. Um <laughs> got on a air flight. Yeah. But, but I thought, <laughs> Yeah, I felt like only three swimmers want to go to that. Um, so it's still right, a, okay. a small, only a small amount. Um, but yeah, we've lost all our, our swimmers because they're, they're not getting the. They've all got to go after uni and get jobs, and mm. they can't commit to the athlete lifestyle um, without the money there. Yeah, I mean, if you've got to fund it yourself, it is a very hard journey to, it's just to stay motivated to keep going, isn't it? Yeah. Just knowing that you, you're going to have to do a full-time job to pay for your hobby and it, it can be draining and mentally as well as physically. Uh, is there any sort of prize money available for you when you go to these competitions? No, there's nothing. I, no. no. Oh my. I, I know um, this, uh, this. I know that Bush will get prize money and it's a lot of money. I don't know the actual figure, but I've been told. Um, I'm not going to put a number but a figure out there because I'm completely wrong. Mm. But yeah, it's, um, it's a lot of money I've been told we should get, but we get nothing there. That's shocking. I mean, this is where equality has to come in because you, I assume the training you do is much the same as an able body swimmer, maybe eight, ten times a week. Would I be right in saying yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's exactly, it's, I mean, exactly the same stuff. Um, I push myself and obviously I, I've got that end goal in my mind at all times, so it's um, mm. I know what I'm aiming for. But obviously, for them, um, it's hard. It's hard sometimes. It's hard sometimes when you get an off and you're like, "This is my, it's my money. I'm paying into this. This makes it more. Yeah, it's harder." Yeah, because the event, the event of itself, the Deaf Olympics, isn't really too dissimilar to Olympics and Paralympics. It's just a different sort of category if you like so they should be the yeah. same they should be the same level um is there anything majorly different between the, the three competitions um well i've been told that people obviously when they go to it they're actually surprised at the level of standard um of the organization you know it's obviously we go to, we we're not under to like Paralympics pitts go to the exact same place in tokyo um, coming mm. up they'll be competing there we don't have that we go to um we go to another place because it's run by a different organisation. Mm -hmm. um, it's a shame you couldn't go to the same place and use the facilities over yeah. again because it, it might it save money for that organisation. And... I mean, obviously, I don't know what goes on at the higher levels of organisations, mm. but I've always said that. I was like, you know what? It'd be great if we could... It could be at three different events, you know, yeah. like three different organisations, or the Olympic, no, Olympics, Paralympics, Death Olympics. That'd be great. Like, it'd be more exposure for them exposure for us as well yeah makes sense doesn't it makes sense now i i believe in our research leading up to this podcast we we found out bucks is now recognizing being deaf as its own category when it comes to bucks competition this year so i think it's s15 is yes, that sort yeah. of the first step in the right direction to you guys getting a bit more exposure and to putting it on the map absolutely um that's like that's only like one step one hurdle one hurdle gone yeah um, um, well, they changed it really quickly, so I'm surprised how you know how quickly I thought it was going to take longer. Um, but they only, it was it was taken out about five years ago, mm. um, but for, for some unknown reason, really. And then they came back and they were like, "Yeah, we're putting it back in," due to the campaign. So yeah, yeah. it gives you a bit of hope, but obviously, um, it's, it's a small it's a small bit of hope. Is it a case of you needing to go to these? these meets that are televised on TV. So I know before the Olympics, they had the, the Sheffield para meet. Is it a case of you needing to go to those meets and getting exposure at those meets to help your campaign grow and to gain some exposure? Or is it, are there any other avenues that people need to help you out with exposure? Is it meets or is there something else that we can do? Well, I think it's trying to get it to the top, really. You know, the, the, the people that make decisions need to change the way they place they look at deaf women because obviously mm -hmm. you can't, um, especially like say for say for uni with books for example. They all the we get loads of fun, we get loads of support in schools with like scribes reading, you know, you know, equipment and stuff. But they say right when you're when you're in swimming you, or when you're in sport, you, you're, you're not actually disabled. And it's the same with like government payment. You know, to deaf people they give government payment out, but then they're saying in sport actually you're not disabled. 
said it needs to be like a, a change in recognition and support for, for deaf mm-hmm. athletes and funding and um, support really. And that's just a case of continuing your campaign at the moment. So you say you're on 110 days. Are you willing to go for the full year or beyond? Yeah, I've got to. I don't know. Yeah. I can't give up. On, I can't give up. Um, it's great. I knew it was going to be. It's going to be a hard challenge. Mm. Um, but people, people out there, it's not just me that I'm trying to fight for. It's, it's all the younger athletes out that that look at their right. sport but realise when they get to a certain point they can't go any further. Mm. And you want that to change. You want it to be like, oh, I want to aim for the death Olympics gold, where they don't see that. They only see it as like, I've got to, I've got to aim for, or just, just try and, I've got to pay myself. But that's the thing. I've got to pay yeah. myself to do this sport. Mm. Yeah. So I mean, if it came, I don't know, ten years down the line, and you've had a career in deaf swimming where you've had to pay for yourself the whole way through you get to that point even if you never win a major medal but say because of the efforts you've made over your career the younger generation coming through no longer have to pay for their career would you see that as a successful kind of swimming career for you yeah absolutely obviously the only reason i started this was for well it was for them really i wasn't i knew that the likelihood of me getting the benefit of it was going to be quite was more likely. I can only hope that it comes in soon, and you know, I can mm. after Death Olympics because I know it won't come before Death Olympics. If, if it was going to happen, it would happen very soon. Um, but if after Death Olympics, um, if it doesn't come in, then yeah, I, I'll I'll have to do it for the younger ones because um, I don't know how long I can keep doing this sport at this level without the funding because I can't yeah, keep yeah. paying. I can't get a job and I can't keep going to these competitions and trying to perform at the highest level and come back and then get into another job. And yeah, it's yeah. not going to work. So yeah, it will be for the young ones and it will be mm. successful if it. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think it's amazing sort of the challenges that you're facing and the fact that you've already traveled the world basically to do these competitions and it's not been cheap and I, I'm adding the figures up in my head I'm just like wow that's a, that's a lot of money that you've had to find yourself that's yeah. the that's the price of a first car that's all stuff like that yeah. it's not it's not cheap at all I think it's outstanding that you've got this commitment to swimming and you're you're paying yourself to do it it's it's incredible um what can we as propulsion swimming and our listeners do to help you is there anything that we can get on board with? Sign a petition, help you with a GoFundMe page. Is there anything that we can get on board with and we can direct people towards? Yeah, so obviously we could continue sharing the campaign really because I think the more exposure you, they get, you get, you can't hide from it. The more exposure, mm. the better the better result. Um, and obviously, like you said, the, the go, the go, there will be a GoFundMe page. As much as I, I don't like asking people for money, I don't. I really don't like it. It's getting. This is this is reason why I stopped doing. Um, why I started this is because it got to a point where you, you can't keep asking family and friends and people out in my community to keep, you know, donating money because it's not. It doesn't feel great for me to be asking people for money all the time. Um, but yeah, it'd be I'm gonna start going going for my page shortly, so that'll be set up. And then really, it's trying to get these top organisations for the swimming, um. Some some high levels in the government to actually ch- ch- to realise that deaf athletes need to be treated equally amongst their power athlete peers. And, I wouldn't yeah. feel too guilty about asking people for money to fund your career. Dan did it to make sure he got to the elite <laughs> <laughs> to get for him to get to the elite level. He had to be sponsored and funded for that one. Uh, from my point of view, I actually think it's impossible to get to the top level without funding or some sort of financial help. And so the fact that you've got as far as you have all off your own back is full credit to you. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. Like Scott was saying, I mean, I mean, that's really, really good. And you deserve all the credit and praise in the world. Honestly, you do. Mm. Yeah. We're going to carry on supporting your campaign and push it out there as much as we can. We'll, we'll get in touch with a few people behind the scenes as well and see if they can help Mm. you out. Um, That'd be great. Thanks. Before we kind of end this podcast, Nathan, because it's been great chatting to you, I actually want to do our usual quick fire questions that we do to uh, our elite swimming guests because you are an elite swimmer. Um, so to start with, what is your favourite event in swimming? Um, 200 free. 200 free, yeah. Good choice. Good event. <laughs> <laughs> Who is your swimming idol? Uh, Michael Phelps, actually, yeah. I met him um, back when I was a young, a young swimmer. 
That's cool. Yeah. Mm. Um, what's your proudest moment in swimming? Um, probably you know, that first international competition. I was only uh, sixteen at a time, and so yeah, definitely get definitely get that first first call. Uh, what's the hardest set you've ever done in training? It's been too many. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of anything. I couldn't think of it. There's been too many that I can't. That's all right. Um, and if you were to go on a road trip, you've got three spaces in the car. Who would you take with you? They can be friends, family, or celebrities. Or, you know, you could just it's put hard. all the people in charge of funding and hijack them and take them away until they fund <laughs> yeah. you. That's a great, a great idea. <laughs> I'll take everyone. I'll have a long, a long talk on this road trip. Yeah. Uh, um, before we end this podcast, I know some people are going to be asking us, well, Nathan Steph, how, how has he spoken to you on this podcast? So why don't you first, why don't you end with explaining how you're able to communicate with us on, on this platform? Yeah, um, so, well, I've got cochlear implants, which really does, so that's not normal, like hearing aids, but with hearing aids, um, it really gives you a, a, a certain level of hearing. With, it, with implants, once you reach a certain level of deafness, you get cochlear implants, uh, which which took mine up right really high, so I can hear really quite well with them when I was about fifteen. But one of the uh, positive that's come with it is that it's got Bluetooth connected to it, and um, so it connects to my phone. So I'm just like it's Bluetooth, so whatever you say is straight to me, my implants and straight to my head. And um, so that's that's how it's quite. I can hear you without any any confusion. This is not how I hear in the water, by the way. Yeah, I was going to say you you can't wear those for swimming, can you? Mm. Nothing. I've got no hearing in the water at all. Great stuff, Nathan. Well, like I said, we're going to keep supporting your campaign. We'll push it out there. If anyone has any questions for you, we'll direct them to your Twitter page. I think is the best place to get hold of yeah. you. Um, yeah. And we'll we'll put a few links in the description of this podcast as well. Um, thank you so much for coming on to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I know we've been lining this up for a little while. We've been wanting to do yeah. it for a while, so it's been great having you on. I'm really interested in hearing your story. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And it's really good that you're uh, giving me some more exposure out there. Mm. Thank you. Well, very best of luck with your campaign, and hopefully it gets sorted soon. But keep going until you get heard, basically. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, looking forward to seeing how you get on over in Brazil as well. Mm. Yeah. yeah, hopefully, hopefully, be a good, be a good result. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Okay, that just about rounds up this week's episode from the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. We'll be back next week with, I believe, an ISL preview because racing is around the corner again, would you believe? So if you haven't subscribed already to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, please do so on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. We'll be back in seven days' time. Thanks for listening, everyone. Cheers. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.